Hi, hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much and for joining us this evening. And my name is Jin from SG Nove. I'm very happy to have you uh, come all the way here to join us for, for our second event of the year. Uh, so happy 2020 to everyone as well. Uh, for those of you who are new to SG Innovate, uh, welcome. For those who are repeat uh, attendees here at all of our events, uh, welcome again to you as well. Uh, just a quick introduction about SG Innovate. So SG Innovate, we are an investor, a builder of deep tech startups. Uh, we do a lot of these events just to keep uh, engaged with the ecosystem and to build the deep tech community um, so that because we believe that with deep technology, building from Singapore, built from Singapore for the world, uh, we can all have a great impact um, and make a difference to the world itself. So um, out of all the events that we have, uh, we focus on deep technology. Examples include um, AI, uh, med tech, health tech, um, quantum technologies, and of course today's event will be on the robotics revolution. Um, so we're very happy to be partnering with the Institution of Engineers Singapore for this particular event. And without further ado, I'll pass on the mic to Andy from IES to give us an introduction about the things that they do. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, and thank you, Jean, and good evening, everybody. My name is Andy. I'm from the Institution of Engineers Singapore, IES, Incubator and Accelerator. We call it INCA for short. Yeah, so yeah, I'm from uh, IES INCA. And our role is really to incubate engineers who are doing their um, technology venture to help them in their scaling up and also fundraising uh, um, activities. So welcome all of you to um, SG Innovate and also to this event. We titled this event Robotics Revolution because, as you know, robotics is growing in a great way and we need more engineers to be involved and to build you know, great technology ventures. How many engineers are there in the room? Just see a raise of hands. Oh, okay. Maybe about 20%. We need more engineers to come. <laughs> yeah, okay. So, so no, they say robotics are taking over the world, but I don't see that many engineers involved. So how are we going to take over the world without that? It's a long way to go. Okay, next slide, please. So, for those who may not know, IES, Institution of Engineers, is the national body for engineers in Singapore, and it's been um, founded in 1966, uh, uh, and it's been around for a long time, looking after engineers in various aspects. And we have, um, okay, we have um, developed the um, Institution of Engineers to support engineers in the incubator. Our mission of IES is really to advance and promote science, art, and professional engineering for the well-being of mankind. The vision for IES is to be the heart and voice of engineers in Singapore and to be a national body to represent engineers. Okay. So IES Inca is a new incubator. We started in 1st of July, 2019. It's been about six months, and we have uh, six incubators with us. Yeah, so this is the logo for IES Incubator. Um, yeah. So what we strive to be is to be the hub for um, engineers technopreneurs, uh, investors, and mentors to come together to build um, great engineering ventures. Okay. So this uh, logo represents the, um, a hub where we join all the different parties together. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So that's what our incubator's mission is, um, to really support science, technology, um, engineering ventures to build great products and help them to be successful in the market. And we want to really create a, a vibrant engineering venture community that really transforms life through technology. Okay. This is our uh, um, board of directors of our IES incubator. Uh, you may recognize some of them. We have really got a big spread of uh, engineers and also an accountant to help us in the business aspects. <laughs> okay. These are our partners in uh, IES Inca. We work with uh, various parties, Enterprise Singapore, IPI, uh, A-Star Accelerate, also with um, NUS and also NTU. Yep. And also a very new partner that we have is ISCA, it's the Institute of Singapore Chartered Accountants, and they're providing us mentors in the accounting and business areas. Okay. Uh, IES is also closely linked to various uh, engineering organizations across ASEAN, so this helps us um, to find partners to enter into those markets in the ASEAN areas. Yep. So it's um, linked in this uh, Asian ASEAN Federation of Fe Engineering Organizations, consisting of uh, various organizations like IES in Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, um, Cambodia, all the ASEAN countries. Yeah. 
Okay, what does uh, IES incubator really do? We engage with IES angel members, corporates uh, who want to have uh, their own spin-offs, IHL spin-offs, and we provide um, engineering translation support, mentorship, business uh, support to really help them in their growth of their venture. Okay, and uh, we are focusing on these areas of the of the um, new ventures, um, infrastructure technology, IoT, clean tech, and most importantly here is robotics. Yeah, so we want to support companies who are in the robotics area to help them to grow and to uh, raise funds to be able to scale effectively. Okay, so and that's why we are running this event today to really reach out to all those um, industry people, individual engineers who are interested in robotics um, to learn more about what's happening in the robotics fields. Okay, so IAS Inca um, helps companies in their business structuring, business planning, and uh, fundraising through our IES mentors and also IES network. Yeah, so companies that come to us, they exit incubation with an uh, executable business plan, the required funding, and a strengthened uh, team and resources to go after their mission. So which kind of companies do we incubate? We are looking for uh, teams which have completed their customer discovery and validation. They have a MVP, they want to scale up. The market size they're looking for is at least a million dollars and above. And um, one of the key team members must join as an IES member for us to support. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we are also keen to work with companies with corporate venture funds to invest into some of our incubators. We can also work with incubators who have uh, teams that need engineering support and uh, mentoring. We can also work with companies who want to spin off and also companies with problem statements. We are happy to engage them to understand their needs. Yeah. Okay. So if you have a tech venture that you're working on, you find that you need support from the IES uh, community, feel free to contact myself or my colleagues, uh, Jimmy at the back or um, Zen at the back or Li Yuan at the back to um, have a conversation with us. And if you are an engineer, you are keen to join us as IES member, feel free to re uh, approach Li Yuan at the back there. Okay. That's all I have to share. These are my contacts. Feel free to have a chat with me later and um, to talk about your company or interest in incubation. Or if you know anybody who is working on technology in the engineering space, deep tech space, who wants to be incubated or just wants to get support and help, feel free to connect with us. Thank you. So we're going to go on to the next part of the um, introduction. We're going to get uh, Dr. Marcelo Ang from uh, uh, NUS to share about very interesting developments in robotics and applications. So we invite uh, Dr. Marcelo Ang on stage to share with us. Thank you very much. I think he will click for me, it's but really I need the clicker. Okay. okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Marcelo. Um, I'm very happy to share with you robotics. And actually, it's, it's close to my heart. Another important topic that's close to my heart is innovation. You know, I've been working in robotics for a long time, but in working in the university, I'm always curious to, to, to see uh, why we have projects ending as museum pieces, <laughs> right? Uh, demos, everything, and sometimes we have exciting project before it becomes a museum piece. Uh, company says, I want 10 of them, and but then we cannot do it, right? Uh, okay, oh shoot, password. Yeah. Unfortunately, it don't look like the, the face recognition. Uh, sorry. No worries. Uh, okay, I have to go by pin. Uh, pin, two, two, okay. <laughs> six, one, six. Yeah, uh, because it was default for okay. face recognition. So. <laughs> it, which surprisingly works quite well, even when I'm with glasses, even I had a haircut, <laughs> still works, uh, which is amazing. That's one of the technologies, it's kind of scary. Yeah? Uh, I, want, I wonder if one day they will accept face as a second factor authentication for your bank transactions. Right? And w the, the real solid test is you should try it, take a picture of yourself, and show the picture to the camera. Yeah, I think it can be fooled to a uh, quite, quite scary. Anyway, so I was talking about innovation. So what is needed to bring technology that is proof of concept, it works, to really be impact to the society, right? And uh, engineers are very important, obviously, but that's enough. What do you think is the second discipline that's most important besides engineering? 
No, yeah, that's not a discipline. I mean, but everybody should have determination. Yeah, uh, marketing, which is part of the business. Yeah, so business. That's, what, that's why nice being in the university, we have the faculty of business too. Another third one, people always forget after business, it's social science, humanities. Why humanities? Because technology is there for people. So we need to understand people and how robotics and any other technology can work with people. Helping people will be the ultimate tool, not to replace people, but to replace jobs that people ought not to do. Dangerous job, meaningless job, cleaning toilets, those non-mundane, non-fun jobs. And we begin to see that in what they call robotic process automation, but that's that is an is interesting term. Huh? Somebody visited me to interested in robotic process automation. Yeah, come, I show him all the robots. He, oh, uh, I, he looks like I'm in the wrong place. Huh? You know what robot process automation means? It means uh, automatic data entry, all, all the financial <laughs> things, like, but they call it robotic process. It's being um, maybe one day all the tellers in the back, all the, uh, we have cashless, uh, no, uh, cashier-less supermarket checkout counters, uh, so things like this, right? Okay, so. I'm going to talk about the trends today in robotics. Uh, I have to turn this on. Pointer, pointer. Where's the pointer? Oh, OK. There's some, that's not a pointer. That's the next back. Uh, oh. hmm, never mind. Uh, you will do uh, AI, and when I point, you know what I'm pointing at. Right? <laughs> OK? <laughs> OK, so trends. Robotics is very useful in industrial automation, factory automation. People call this lights out factory. There is no people inside the factory. There's a gate. If you can imagine, there's the people outside the gate. If the gate opens, right, the robot shuts down. It's called lights out because the robot can operate without eyes. Because the robot has knowledge of the exact position of the work pieces, the exact size, exactly how to grasp them, where to go. Right, so it doesn't need, because robots can move very accurately. It can do that, so you don't need, that's why lights out factory. But it's dangerous when human comes in, the, this is ro welding a car, it doesn't know there's a human there, welds the human too, right? It doesn't care, it just keeps doing it. It's kind of stupid, but very good. It's, it's superbly stupid, which is good, right? Because it can do the job, it works. Up to today, it's still working. But the challenge of robotics is, I think, is how to bring this robot out of this environment, out of this factory environment, which I characterize as structured, non-human, to everyday life, to my home, to this room, perhaps to clean the place after this event, to the hospitals, to the airports, to our daily living spaces, and how to adapt it. And in the following slides, I will show you some of the recent trends we're working on, everybody in the world is working on, and uh, what are the technologies needed and where we are today and how, how will be the future. But before doing that, let me give you a slight uh, an example of how robotics is today, comparing it with IT. Now, when computers were invented, what do you think the inventor of the computer submitted to a funding agency to get funding to build a computer, to do research on computer? What's the purpose of the computer? This is during the times of war. Uh, perhaps it's, you will agree, maybe, I'm not exactly sure, but it's along the lines of heavy computation for military application, perhaps how to make sure the atomic bomb explodes without hurting other countries, for example, control the explosion, every all this thing, heavy computation. But today, what is the most use of computers? Okay, uh, it's, a, it's a question mark. When I was perhaps uh, my student's age, the heavy use of computers were word processing. Who remember WordStar? Yeah, words are good. If I ask this to the students, nobody raises their hand. Yeah. <laughs> words are, and scientific, scientifically, it's called, there's a version called Chi Writer. I think you remember Chi Writer too, right, for equations. Imagine if the computer inventor said, give me money so I can build a computer to replace the typewriter. It would be thrown out, right? Now, uh, what's the next application besides word processing? But it, yeah? What, what's that? What, what did you say? Excel. Excel, yes, Excel, spreadsheet, correct? Spreadsheet, but, but there's no manual equivalent of spreadsheet. There's no machine. Yeah, there's no, maybe the abacus is over the equivalent. Yeah, but before spreadsheet, I was more thinking of the, but it, I like it, that spreadsheet is also used. And I use, I was the first in the Philippines, I grew up in the Philippines, to use the uh, very advanced spreadsheet called Visicalc. Who know Visicalc? Yes, okay. Now it became Lotus 1, 2, 3. Now it's 
Excel, of course. I, I was the first to use it because I worked for a foreign company called Intel. They were in the Philippines, have interesting stories about life of, of Intel in the Philippines. Now they're gone from the Philippines. So. Um, and uh, because it's a, we, I work in Intel, it's an uh, export-free zone or something like that. So we get the first, I had the first IBM PC with a super big hard disk of 10 megabytes. <laughs> Five and a quarter, huge, yeah? but it's interesting. So I was programming physical. But the application I was looking for are games. Right? Remember the Atari games, the very nice games on TV, very fancy games, huh? but on, on very, today's computer, Super Mario, right? Uh, I, still, I still have the Mario hat, the green and the red. Yeah, so it, it's very interesting. Again, another example, if somebody wrote, I need a computer to do games, it will be thrown out, right? Uh, and actually, uh, it was rumored that T.J. Watson, we know the IBM, famous uh, IBM T.J. Watson in New York, Right, said there's no room for a computer in your homes. He said that, yeah? yeah. Now how wrong he was, it's not only in our homes, it's also in our pockets. Everybody has handphones now, which, are, which is more powerful than the PDP-11. The PDP-11 is one of the work, I don't know, it's a mainframe that controlled the first ping pong playing robot in the early 80s. And that PDP-11 is one fourth of this room, right? And our, your, your Samsung Note 8, I think it's faster than that. Huh? It's interesting. Such is the nature of breakthrough technology. It serves its in initial purpose, but the real application is much more beyond that. Right? Robotics is today what people say robots only in factories. Right? You won't be wearing a robot, maybe, but maybe in the future, what will be the equivalent of the phone that we carry around that helps us not only with data augmentation, but with physical augmentation. Now, to help us, as I grow older, I'm getting old, when I retire, I want to still do rock climbing, maybe. Yeah? I want to be able to enjoy life. And how can I wear a robot to do that, maybe? Yeah? So that's interesting. And, what, and we're working towards getting to that direction. I hope you're inspired and to have developed new applications to be the equivalent of yeah, everybody carrying your own iPhone or your own Android phone, but you are carrying your own soft robotic, maybe your clothes is a robot, right? That it's not, it's not like the Iron Man type thing, because the Iron Man is a bit scary to wear, right? And you won't want that beside you, right? Okay. So I call it everyday robotics. How do we get here? But before that, it's two keywords structured, human robot separation, right? Go hand in hand. It's always, even if it's a structured environment, it still will become unstructured once human is there. It's almost like a new house. My new home, my wife was very happy, it's so clean. <laughs> but after a week, yeah, and now it's almost, uh, he said, I hopeless, he give up, huh? uh, she give up. Uh, anyway, because once the human is in there, the structuredness becomes unstructured. And how, wh how do we get there so robots can work in unstructured environment where there's human robot interaction? Like the, the mall, the grocery aisles, even the airport, the hostels, any environment that is non-industrial. So the term in robotics, they call that category of robot. One is industrial, which I showed on the left. The one, the best description is, guess what you call this? Uh, huh? Collaborative robot, yes, service robot, social robot, but there's only one term that satisfies everything, non-industrial robot. Yeah, it works. Yeah, non-industrial means everything else, right? Actually, if you look at uh, the definition of service robotics, it means anything that's non-industrial. But then it's not so clear too, because this is also doing service, right? Yeah, but anyway, so the clear thing is non -industrial. So how do we get there? How do we solve the arrow, right? Oh, sorry, not used to this clicker. Yeah, we have to move to factors designed for the robots to be the other way around. Robots must adapt to an existing environment which is designed for who? Human beings, right? Our home is designed for human beings. Um, it's not for the robots. So I do not want, humans do not want to compromise how we live because a robot is gonna be there. An example of that is the early days of mobile robots. For mobile robots to move around to do material delivery, and give uh, pick and place materials in different places in a factory, you need to have uh, lines on the floor, like guides, right? 
to guide the robot like tape. So every time you want to change the path, you have to remove the tape, change it. But today we don't do that anymore because we don't change the environment. The robot has sensors that detect the natural environment, the walls, the shelves, and can use that to localize itself, right? And we use that also the same idea in our work on self-driving vehicles because we do not use GPS. Because GPS is not reliable, you know, when we look at it, and we want to work our vehicles indoors too where there's no GPS. So the one challenge is how can we, how can a robot know where it is, right? Using its own sensors without relying on the environment telling it what it is, right? And to answer that question, we always ask, how, does hu how do humans do it? We have eyes, how do I know? How do I know that's an exit door? How do I know how to walk there and avoid people, right? We just do it, right? Yeah, but so how, how can we give that intelligence to the robot? So that's one challenge. So the task is really, I mentioned this already, we are too intelligent to do many of these mundane tasks. I call this the five Ds of robotics. Yeah, these are the bad Ds, dangerous dirty tasks like cleaning toilets, degrading, I don't want to be, to be seen, demeaning, I'm too intelligent to do that. Guess what the fifth D is? Driving vehicles, right? Because I say that it's not because driving is mundane. It can be mundane if there's traffic jam. But if you're racing, it's not mundane, it's fun, right? But for everyday commute, it's not fun, right? And not only that, more important reason is safety. I really believe that computers can drive a car safer. Can, not yet, but can, right? Why can? It's a no-brainer. It has sensors that see everything, even behind. We can drive cars, I don't see behind, I can still drive. Imagine if we have eyes all over. Not only us, not only that, we have eyes that see things and also know distances. And we have sensors, I can see you, I know who you are, I know how far you are accurate to a MM. Right? So if we have that, it has all better sensing. That's one. Second, the brain doesn't get tired. Right? It doesn't get sleepy. Yeah, it's repeatable. It doesn't get emotional. Somebody overtakes the car, no problem. <laughs> yeah, no revenge, no rage. Right? Because rage, driving is stressful. Road rage is, I can imagine road rage. Yeah? If, if, you know, there are many idiots, right? Um, really, uh, in Singapore, just search parking idiots Singapore. You can see all the idiots, right? Okay, and, uh, and it's really nice. That's the advantage of social media, which another application of computing, right? That we, for uh, we forgot. Uh, uh, I'm sure the inventor never thought about social media. So, but why are we not yet there is the planning. Right? How, do the, how do you turn the steering wheel? How do I avoid obstacles, right? And I, I, I'm going to explain the, the, the challenges too. And uh, human face that all the time too. If I'm driving, I see another car. I have some a mental picture. That driver is maybe, maybe I shouldn't say this, but never mind. I'll say it. Huh? It's a lady driver. <laughs> this guy is a, 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 this guy is a, 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 but some ladies are better drivers than me, of course. Uh, and uh, so too young to drive or fresh driver. Yeah how to understand their behavior and predict what they're gonna do in the next one second, two seconds, and five seconds later. And that's the biggest challenge. You have to predict that, and then you can plan your action based on your prediction. So, in, this is very important, especially in, in Singapore, where we don't have resources. Our only resource is people. So, and we want to do things that are high value add, right? Take away all the mundane, right? Let the mundane, let the robot do it. This is a task that I want to share, what I view about technology in general. Uh, robotics is one big, clear example. We want to go from up to down, right? Let's do a task of washing machine. A washing machine is perhaps somewhere here. It's a relatively simple task. And if you look at the top graph, the washing machine may be one fourth here. Uh, the machine does almost everything. If you do, the human does little. What does the human do? setting, 60 minutes, uh, soft, delicate, yeah, all those things, right? And it just presses a button, and that thing washes, right? Now, how do we improve that? Maybe a future washing machine, right, can be uh, why we always want to have challenge ourselves, right? Can the washing machine stop washing when the clothes are already clean? Very simple, right? Why do I need to set the time? Can it just, just stop, right? And I don't, I don't need to do anything else. I just on, 
right? But I still need to do on. Right? It's okay. Yeah, so that is this. Make the machine more intelligent. Human does little. Now, to do that, I always ask people, friends, anybody, right? To do that, we have already technology that can do that very easily. It's a no-brainer too. What you do is you see how, how does the human wash clothes? How do you know whether clothes are dirty or not? If it's a dirty shirt, you put in water, what happens? The water becomes dirty, right? It becomes murky, right? So if you have a sensor that can sense the murkiness of water or the transparency of water, then that can be used to regulate how much you clean. You keep cleaning until it's clear, right? Yeah, and we have very cheap, less than $1 sensors for that. Light sensors, you have a transmitter passing through the water, a receiver. If water is clear, what you transmit gets received 100%. If 50% if, if gets received, that means it's half dirty. If zero, that means it's super dirty, yeah, and things like that, right? So we move here, we build technology, life improves, right? But then we will keep raising the bar, right? I say, oh, I want, what's the next if we put another curve there, right? What is the next? Maybe one day I want, I don't need to turn it on. Once I load it, it ons itself. Or maybe I don't want to load it. It should know how to load myself, itself. Maybe when I get home, it just takes off the clothes for me. <laughs> if it's dirty, if it smells nice, yeah, I don't need to wash, right? Maybe. So people will always raise the bar. As you raise the bar, uh, this complex task becomes more and more complex, and as you do that, quality of life improves, right? Another example is driving cars. It's a complex task, driving cars, right? But machines also do something, right? Uh, adaptive cruise control, maintaining the distance of the car in front. If the car is faster, you auto pass. Uh, lane keep assist, auto parking. Yeah, these are in interesting things. We call those level two automation, right? Level two, level three at best, but ad advanced driver assistance system, right? That's there. Humans still have to drive, but we're working toward level five automation. Level five automation means completely hands-off driving, no manual, no human takeover. It's no autopilot, right? It's, it's really, so you don't need a driver license to use a car. You don't need a driver's seat to waste that space for a car. Because sometimes I take Grab, I cannot because there are five of us. It's kind of waste, right? I mean, so it, it's nice. So then we go here, but humans still have to do something, right? What? You still have to book the car. Um, wh where's the race, the next bar? Next bar maybe just reads your mind, knows where you want to go. Yeah, they're, they're, so we, we, uh, humans never get satisfied. Yeah, but as we go in, it's nice, that's what drives life. And it's interesting, I think that's the purpose of life is to keep improving. Right, so this is where we are. This is how I want, no, not where we are. This is how I want to really look at anything, any product we have, look at this. Uh, how can the, so in any of this, you will notice any vertical line you draw whether it's a top curve or bottom curve, there's always a human aspect, there's always a robot aspect or a machine aspect. Because robots and machine have to work together. It's not machine replacing the human. Humans still have to turn it on, right? Okay. The ultimate robot is perhaps must have these capabilities, mobility, a mobile base, the moving arm, and a certain arm, right? Certain arm. So it has to be there, right? It has to move around and to do some manipulation, some action, right? And it must have intelligent mechanics um, to be able to operate in an unstructured world. You don't want robots like this to operate in your home because it's a bit scary, right? Yeah, and you don't want an Iron Man in your home too, right? Yeah, you want something soft, maybe somebody like Baymax or in Big Hero or some flabby little thing that you, or, or a pillow that you embrace but that's actually a robot and it can embrace you back and, and you can imagine what else it can do to you, right? Okay, that, that's a very interesting application, especially in Japan. I, I really like Japan. Okay, so that's the hardware improvements. Second, software improvements, the intelligence, right? We need to have intelligence in the robot, improve the intelligence so it can know, I can understand, understand the imprecise world, right? Some people think if I have a super accurate robot, will it solve all their problems? Because they try to make robots very accurate. I don't think so. Actually, you don't even need to pick super accurate robots for unstructured environments. You need super accurate robots in factories, industrial robots, right? Because in unstructured environments, even if you have a very accurate robot, the environment is not accurate. You cannot hand have perception 
that will exactly know the location exactly. So there will be always errors. So even if the robot is precise, follows what you command, your command is always with error. So if, it's, if there's error, a 1 mm error, when you're trying to pick up something, hit something, a very precise robot with 1 mm accuracy or sub 1 mm accuracy because you want 1 mm endpoint accuracy would be very stiff. So if you hit something, it will destroy it. So it's very dangerous, right? So it will not work. So you need a soft robot. And why that is okay? Because human beings are proof of existence. We are not accurate. Our motion, I can move my feet accurately, but I can walk without tripping most of the time. <laughs> yeah? But uh, I still get fooled sometimes if the floor is slippery. Yeah? But we can do a lot of things that robots are very hard, find very hard to do, uh, because we lack, robots lack the intelligence of human beings, right? And that's this thing here. Okay, now the following slides show some of our work on this. These are some of the, I call it intelligent mechanics. Uh, what kind of materials? For example, here, uh, this, this one, sorry, this is one kind. I think I skipped a slide, uh, sorry, but never mind. This is a double-sided tape, right? If you put an electric voltage on it, right, it will expand from left to right with voltage. Turn off the voltage, it goes back to its original state. It's like a rubber band. You put a voltage, the rubber band stretches. You turn off the voltage, the rubber band compresses back, right? So what immediately that reminds me, or everybody, it should, of our, our muscles, right? Our muscles, you put electrical energy, it sort of, I forget where they extend or contract, but one of them, it turns off, goes back, right? So, so it's the same, so up to you what you want to do that. In the lower left, we create that to make an inchworm mechanism, right? Like a caterpillar moving, on, off, on, off. Uh, upper right, uh, you show how, how, how by turning on and off voltage, it can stretch down or up. And the reverse effect is also happening in the lower right. In other words, you don't give voltage, you give motion, and that motion will create voltage. It's like a motor can also be operated as a generator, uh, same thing. So perhaps one day, you go hardware store, you, you buy a lot of 3M tapes, you put a lot of voltages in, you, you, you do some engineering marvel, and you put it under your shoes, maybe that can charge your phone. Yeah? It's an energy harvesting device. Put it under the roads, right? all the roads going, it will charge all our lampposts, our lights, traffic lights, right? if we have anything. If you want to amplify the energy, right, you just put many things on stuck on top of each other. The only negative thing about that, it's not really negative, but people think it's negative, is this one. Uh, the voltage required is on the order of five to 10,000 volts, but it's in DC, right? Is it, not, is it dangerous? There's no current that's flowing. Yeah, why? Because it's an electric field, right? it's a di dielectric. So there's no, except the leakage. So the current flowing is only pico amp, so it's very safe. But of course, if you expose the wires and touch it, you'll have fun with it, right? Yeah, but it, it's very safe. And we have demonstrated you can power that with AA batteries, right? Now there's so many nice electronics. With 1.5 volt, you get 10,000 volts, just a small chip. Right? Because the current is very low. So this is one example. Can we use this to create wearable robots and perhaps w carry the battery in our, um, together with our phone and do that? Uh, there is another video. Uh, no? OK. Oh, one slide was missing, but never mind. One slide is, uh, maybe I should go back here. Let's use imagination, <laughs> because one slide was missing. Uh, it, it should be there, huh? I don't know, maybe. Does, this is sluggish. Huh? Okay, one slide, this is electrical, one side is pneumatics. Pneumatics, we use silicon, right? And to, uh, to mold a silicon material, and we put air channels inside it, and by pumping air in it, you can have fingers that move like this, and we can have soft grippers, that are literally like balloons, right? Yeah, and we have we made arms out of it. There was supposed to be a video on it. Sorry, I I I, I thought it was there. Uh, maybe maybe this pointer is sluggish. Uh, maybe maybe not. I don't know. I always like to blame technology, but it's my fault maybe. So another kind of let's move away from hardware now is software. But software in terms of intelligence. But I like to divide it into the 
first into the lowest form of intelligence I call reflex action. We want to enable the robot with reflex action so that when the robot, for example, touches a hot object, it will not uh, naturally do that without thinking so much. Like how, how humans do it. And by cooking, I touch hot, I do this. I don't think hot. Oh, it's, it's painful. What do I do now? Yeah, yeah, then I do that. You cannot do that, right? It's, it, it, and actually, it's a fact. You cut your head off. We don't do that. But the human will always do this. Do you believe me? If you have a dead body, you just uh, put a hot object, the, it will do this. Yeah? Yeah, actually, we cannot experiment on that yeah, or for obvious reasons. But we have done that, I have done that for chicken. Yeah? If you chop the head of a chicken in a very uh, humane way, yeah? very super sharp, quick, bang, right? The chicken can walk up to one minute. It's interesting. It walk, and walking is a very complicated control problem. How does it walk without falling? And it is understood, it has been researched, the biological beings have something in the spine. Uh, that generates what's called central pattern generators uh, that allows automatic motion without high level decision making. And one of them, and I call this reflex action. And we try to do that uh, on this. Uh, uh, can you turn off the sound? Okay. Uh, that's quality. Uh, for example, this task, the, the first two, are very hard to do, right? Uh, if you have. Let's say you want the book always to be parallel, right? The human is doing the book, but you want the, the person, the robot, to always make the hand parallel to the book, right? Uh, the traditional way to do it is using a computer vision system to detect the position of the book and servo command the robot to do that. But we're not doing that. The robot is blind, no camera. The robot has feelings in the joints. So if I know how I'm feeling, right, I can just feel it. It's called compliant motion. You comply to the environment. I call that reflex action, too. And that can be used to, to do this polishing. For example, if you want the robot to polish your car, but you don't have the geometry of the car. Right? Humans, I can polish. You don't need to tell me the size of the car. I, I can just do. Now, I, I challenge humans. If you're blind, a blindfold, can you polish a car? I think you can do, once you touch it. Because you can feel it. Right? You can feel the edges. You can go around. Right? may not be as good, but that's good enough. Right? So we want to embody the robot with that capability right, without having high-level uh, sensing using proprioception. Proprioception means internal sensing only, feeling. For example, if I want to draw a straight horizontal line, I can draw it with my eyes open. But if my eyes close, I can imagine drawing a straight line because I'm feeling my joints. Right? So robots need to be able to do that. that and that kind of intelligence, internal sense, I call it the lowest level intelligence, a form of intelligence, but that's an, not enough. We need higher level decision making too. Right? Uh, the one on the right is uh, a, a precursor to uh, a very challenging problem. I'm very interested in is how to get a robot to be in our hawker center to clean the tables. Right? The tables, and, and you want to wipe the table. Here is a very challenging table because it has a sharp discontinuity. 90 degree discontinuity, and how does the robot able to discontinuity without leaving contact, right? By, ex by still exerting a, a very, like a 10 Newton force on this. This is very hard problem, very hard control problem, but we're able to do that. This is using the newer robot, KUKA, we did about five, uh, maybe about five, six years ago. This is more than 20 years ago, an old robot, yeah? but we can do much better. With, with better technology. So this is lowest form. Let's go one higher level in terms of the software needed, the intelligence, uh, and is the four things. Right? In any machine that's intelligent, yeah, does these four things, or at least three, the first three, it senses to create an understanding of the environment. After it understands the environment, it plans what to do. Number two, planning. And after it plans what to do, it acts. Now, after it acts, execute the plan, there's the optional fourth one. It will assess its performance in these first three tasks and try to improve how it has done it, right? And learning. Come to think of it, humans do this every day, right? And driving cars is a good example for doing that, right? right. Uh, now, there are two basic approaches to intelligence, to this high-level intelligence. One is the date, uh, is a model-driven approach. You have a phenomena you want to control, 
you create a mathematical model that relates the inputs to the outputs, right? It's a mathematical model. Once you have the model that describes how the system behaves, if you want the output to follow a certain behavior, you can use the model to solve for the required inputs. Very simple. And apply it. But then your model may not be so accurate. If it's not accurate, it doesn't create the desired output. So you have the feedback loop of the errors. Then that feedback loop can allow you to adjust the inputs to have the correct desired outputs, right? We b this is the typical approach, a model-based approach, right? Do we do this in our everyday life? Do you have a mathematical equation? For example, if I'm a robot, to walk, for me, the output is the motion of my limbs, my leg, knee, feet, to walk like this, right? That's the output. The input is my muscle forces. So to do that, to develop the equation, it's impossible. We try to do that. Why is it impossible? Because you, know to, you need to know my mass properties. For example, where is my center of gravity? Where is my moment of inertia amo, amo, along the three principal axes? Where are my three principal axes, right? But I have so many of them. And uh, there's blood flowing. I need to know how much they flow. It's almost impossible. Right? So unfortunately, most of engineering is all about here. Right? We, if we have that, we do it. But if we don't have it, then what do we do? We try to create an accurate model. And people have done that. People have created a model of the humanoid, I don't remember, maybe 50, 57 joints. Yeah, but still not accurate, right? Another approach is perhaps data-driven, which I think what we're doing. Right? A young boy, a toddler, won't know how to walk. But he, he starts walking and falls. And from there, he creates a model of how the input and output are related. Right? For example, you turn on a TV. It's too loud. What do you do? You turn it lower, right? And it's too soft. You turn it high. You do a trial and error. And high, low, high, low, all this experience form data from your experience and allow you next time you turn on the TV, you know how to do it very well. Right? The model-based approach for that is you need to know the mechanism of the TV, how the turning of the knob is converted to voltage, how the voltage is transmitted by the electronics to a speaker, <laughs> and how the speaker creates the voice, how your, thing, yeah, how your ears uh, uh, hear the, the, the sound, right? So it's that. So learning from experience is what we do. Perhaps this learning from experience perhaps is the solution to problems that are so hard because there's no model. Uh, the, f uh, the first learning from experience is detecting animals, detecting a dog from a cat. Or let's forget dog and cat. Let's say a baby. How do you teach your baby, your newborn baby or your sibling, a male and a female, right? Uh, have you ever attempted to teach a person how, what is the meaning of a male? What's the meaning of a female, right? Uh, the only way we say is that's a female, that's a male. If you show enough females, enough males, then that's enough. That's the data, and we, we will know. But then if you ask, can you describe how you know she is female? Uh, maybe you can try, oh, softer skin. But you didn't touch. How do you know it's soft, right? I mean, um, there, there, there are many strange things, right? And, and uh, so that's learning from data. But learning from data is not accurate. As you can see, y humans are also not accurate, our brain. I'm, sh I'm sure you have experienced something you see a friend or somebody, not a friend, a stranger. Suddenly he went to the men's room. I think she's a lady. How come you're in the men's room? Yeah, because you don't know, right? Yeah, uh, because uh, it, uh, it sometimes looks can be deceiving too, right? And this is what people call today deep neural networks. Yeah, this is learning from data. And I'll tell you more about that. But the question is which is to use? Yeah, and the best is to use both a hybrid method. If you have a model, why not use it? Yeah. But then you know the model is not accurate. Use the data-driven approach to supplement the model to make it more accurate. That's one. If you don't have a model, right? for example, driving a vehicle, we don't have a model of that. How do you properly drive a vehicle? So if we don't have a model, we can create a model ourselves. Right? Based on what the pedestrians are doing, what other vehicles are doing, you turn this way, you can create a rule 
an expert system rule-based. Or another way, forget rules, not model-driven, but learn from data. In other words, learn how expert drivers drive. And that will be the data, and you will, our brain somehow knows how to do that. Come to think of it, how did you learn how to drive? Do you learn from a book? I know people, you need the theory book, right? But growing up in the Philippines, I learned driving. I didn't, I didn't have to study any book, right? Because there's no such book. Now, there's a book, but it doesn't be used, right? Yeah, because you learn. I learned from watching my driver that sent me to school every day. And one fine day, I just said, can I drive? Yeah. So how does the brain able to do this, right? Uh, a brief introduction to what people call deep neural networks or modern AI. Uh, is really, can we, em, can we, can we, can we, uh, yeah, oh, I think I skipped that, uh, sorry, because I have only 20 minutes, I talk too much. But maybe we, we try to emulate that with a neural network, with a brain, right, and uh, just try to understand it, a neuron will accept inputs and create output, right, so we, we try to do that, and, and we try a lot of deep neural networks, that means there's many, many neurons connected to each other. So the following slide is some examples. This is an application, uh, a compelling application for autonomous vehicles. There should be sound here. C can we turn on the sound? Yeah. It's always nice of background music. Yeah. Okay. Somebody books the car. And the car uh, comes to you. You want to go to the Kentridge station, but you are the ultimate lazy person. You don't want to walk to the curbside. So you take this vehicle, it brings you to the point, the nearest area where you can board a car. That's why this, we call this a multi-class autonomous vehicle. So the one on top is where the car is. How The red is how much look ahead it's looking. And the dots around it are the people going around. And this is two times the speed. You can see people walking. Later on, it will go back to normal speed. So it goes inside building because, as I said, we don't use GPS. And that's our lecture theater. It, this is inside university town. So it goes, you book it, you want to go to Kentridge Station, right? And as it goes there, this car meets Scott. Scott is another car. It's named after my student who work on it. Uh, that is DJ. It's the driver jockey. Also Damien Che. And this car was also booked together. It's a multi-class, so it knows that Tawit booked it, right? And he, when he boards the car, he enters his pin to say, I'm the one who booked, and he has the option to change the destination. So he enters, and you can see the interface is like the grab interface, the map is there. He has to say, yes, that's the place I want to go. Please go ahead and go. Then it just drives itself. Right. So this is a very interesting application, focusing only on the intelligence, right? Those four things, huh? Uh, sensing, how to sense the environment to know where you are because we don't use GPS. Second, to know the drivable region, right? There's a pothole, I'm, I should be in the left, I should be in the right, where's the sidewalk to detect that and of course to avoid pedestrians and obstacles. And plan, the planning is only steering, accelerator and brake, right? And execution, right? So today, self-driving cars are very safe, but they're very stupid. Right? Everywhere in the world, including ours, they just drive, but they're not confident in overtaking. Right? Uh, Tawit, this guy, he now works for Newtonomy. Newtonomy is a startup that came from our group. It was bought by Aptive, and more recently, it was uh, they have a joint venture with Hyundai. Right? Uh, a very high amount of about four and a half billion US dollars. Billion US dollars, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, anyway. So I'm very happy with this. So today, it's stupid because it doesn't know how to overtake, but it's okay with a fixed route. If there's something in front, it just stops. Wait for it to go away, then go. So it's very good for a fixed route shuttle service. But it's kind of stupid, right? Don't, uh, yeah. But it's, it's, it's stupid, but in the same time, it's safe. You don't follow it because it doesn't overtake, right? Wow, now you tell me it's one minute. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Okay, the, a challenge is uh, rain, right? I think we can be flexible, right? We're all among friends. An advantage having in the evening, we can have more time. Uh, <laughs> sensors, LiDAR and camera do not work on rain, 
right? Uh, if we have an input rainy image, can we get that clean image? This is humans can do this very well. I, I'm not affected by rain because I can imagine how the clean image looks like without the rain. So we, we try to be inspired by that. But so I ask my student, give me a lot of data, pairs of images, rainy image, no rain image, pairs. Easy to get, right? All you do is go outside the lab, wait for the rain, take pictures of the rain, <laughs> take, take, take. I need 10,000 images, okay? Take, 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 and at day and night, of course, I don't do that to my students, right? So what we do is, can we fake it? Can we generate rain from simulation? Right? We can take pictures easily, but can we add rain? And that is what we have done. We have created synthetic data, about 10,000 of them. Uh, these are all added uh, fake. You can use, just use Photoshop. Photoshop has a way to add different streaks of rain. If we also added haze. But interestingly, we showed this data, you know, database data-driven learning. We showed that these two images are the same. So from how the neural network of neurons learns how to clean the image. And we tested it with this kind of neural network. Let's skip that. This is a combination. It's a hybrid because we have we studied the how rain is modeled from atmospheric distortion, haze, etc., and combined that with the neural network to create from left to right, right? And we tested it using synthetic data, and this is the result from left to right. You can see the lower left, very nice, right? But this is synthetic data, yeah? It's not the real rainy data, right? It's, uh, it's fake data. This is the ultimate in fake news, right? This is really fake, <laughs> yeah? But the beauty of fake news, it allows the neural network to learn reality from the fake news. I know, I know what's one minute. No, thank you. And, and we test it on real world data, which is interesting. This is data is not seen in Singapore, and it works quite well. So we're very excited, but this is camera image, we're trying to think how to do that for LIDARs now. Yeah, so these are the results. Sorry, uh, another problem in autonomous vehicles is detecting places. You know where this is, right? Which MRT? Raffles Place. Human knows this. Give it to a computer vision system, totally different, right? Because there's different. How does the human know that it's been there, right? So uh, we have some interesting work on that too. Uh, changes environment is how to teach a computer to know this is permanent, this is not permanent. Uh, and, and the permanent will be part of the map, right? Uh, and you use a neural network. We just give it a lot, of, a lot of images that are the same. Like these two are the same, these two are the same, these two are the same. So learn that they're the same. And if they learn they're the same, next time you show Clementi MRT, with and without people, hopefully, it will do what we call generalization, which is the true measure of intelligence. Because if I show Raffles MRT, it knows it's Raffles, it's, it's not intelligent because it's seen it already. But the true AI, that's why people call it now AGI, artificial general intelligence, is the ability to generalize the concept so you show it a different train station, it knows how to do it. And we tried this, this is some of the videos. Of, uh, we have a project with ST Engineering, uh, funded by Land Transport Authority, to convert a full-size bus to be autonomous. Because we promise, you know, Singapore already promised 2022, right? But most likely 2023. Yeah, maybe next year I'll say 2024. But no, no, we have to do 2023. Just the difference. So we can do perception very well already, very fast. We can also identify whether it's a car, pedestrian, etc. But the planning we're still working. On. Okay, uh, let me skip this. Uh, this is prediction, a very stupid prediction. Um, the dotted line in front of the car is where it will be. It's a no-brainer. It's just constant velocity model. But what else can we do, right? We don't know how the human behaves, so we just assume it will behave consistently, right? And this is the last slide, okay? <laughs> we know a lot about force and motion control, but we cannot do the task yet. Robot cannot drive yet. Robot cannot open doors, cannot pick up objects. You may see in exhibition robots doing very exciting things, like that robot behind, I don't know what it's doing, but if it's doing exciting things, what you need to do is, wow, very nice, then move the things it needs to pick up, and what it will tell you, come back tomorrow, and you do come back tomorrow, then you say, come back tomorrow again, yeah, because it's not able to generalize yet, right? So that's the question mark, and how we knew that, we need data 
to link perception and action. Google is doing that very, very, very actively, how to learn how to grasp object. He just have about 20 robots every day, just grasping, grasping, learning how to grasp, and from there learning to form a knowledge base. Huh? So perhaps the data-driven approach will be an attempt to solve this question mark. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I took longer than expected. No, no, you need to be here. So thank you, Dr. Masalo Ang, for giving us a very interesting insight into robotics and also the development in different areas into different parts of the robots and also autonomous vehicles. So now we will invite our panel of uh, speakers to share with you their work in robotics, in drones, and also in, um, in the academic areas. And some of them are also entrepreneurs, so feel free to ask them some interesting questions about why they do what they do. Okay, let us invite our moderator, Mr. Vivek, to come up. Um, okay, give a round of applause. And we have uh, Sean. We have Sean, who is uh, from uh, h3zoom.ai, the founder of h3zoom.ai. Applause. Okay. Dr. Chen from Twitter uh, Engineering from NTU to join us. Yeah. And lastly, we have uh, Mr. Louis Lu from Solustar. Yeah. Uh, Louis is one of our incubators in uh, IES Incar, and uh, we are very happy to share, let him share. Good evening. I think you will be very excited now already with Dr. Marcelo's exciting presentation. It was very, very insightful. Thanks, doctor. Thank you. So my name is Vivek Parashar. I've been in industry for more than 30 years now. And uh, uh, I have worked for large corporations like HP, Wipro, Venture Corporation. And uh, lately, I have thought that I've start something my own, right? And uh, then I got associated with the IES Inca and with Andy, my ex-colleague, so we, we work together in some of the projects. So today I have been given a very difficult task to moderate this very distinguished panel. Two of them are uh, very distinguished academicians and then two entrepreneurs. So let me just quickly introduce Dr. Marcelo, you already know that you know he has been giving you such a fantastic talk so please give him a loud round of applause again <laughs> then we have Louis Liu who has been who, who is a CEO and founder of Solustar one of very upcoming uh, robotics company uh, later on he will introduce uh, his company to your, uh, to, uh, to us so please give him a round of applause again Sean Koo on my side, uh, see, uh, he's a chief technology officer and co-founder of h3zoom.ai. So later on again, he will introduce his company to yours. And on the rightmost, Zhang Jiamin, Dr. Zhang Jiamin, and he's associate professor, School of Computers, Engineering, and co-director, Institute of Media Innovation in NTU. Please welcome him on the So to kickstart this evening, uh, let me just uh, ask each of them to introduce their work, their company, if they are in a company, and so that at least uh, all of you know that what they do and where they come from. Maybe we'll start with Dr. Chiang Jimin. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Chiang uh, uh, Jimin, right? So I'm working uh, with the School of Computer Science and Engineering and also Institute of Media Innovation, IMI. Actually, my background is not in robotics, and actually, uh, is in 3D computer graphics, animation, uh, geometric modeling, and AR, VR, and so. So, and tonight I represent uh, prof uh, Professor Nadia Tolman, the director for uh, Institute of Media Innovation. So, uh, she's supposed to be here tonight, but just okay. Uh, recently, she underwent uh, surgery, and now she's still with the uh, hospital. 
Right, so, but I worked with her in um, past few years on a few um, projects funded by National Research Foundations. Uh, one called Being There and another one Being Together. So one outcome is a social uh, robot, a Nadine social robot, right? So maybe you have already heard of the, this Nadine. So uh, I can uh, introduce some background or some application of the Nadine for you. And uh, you can say, okay, this is a quite a realistic uh, social robot. Uh, it is actually, it is uh, modeled after uh, Nadia Thoman herself. It looks quite similar. <clears throat> so it's a social robot, it so looks like, I mean, it has very natural skin and natural hair. And also we design, we design and develop like software, software platform, which allow uh, Nadine to communicate with people and can memorize the things, events happened in the past and uh, can also answer some uh, general questions. So maybe next slide, please. <coughs> and this, uh, yeah, so here this video show uh, the interaction between, eight, no, the, two, uh, the previous one. Yeah, this one, okay. What is your nationality? So you can see the interaction between Nadine not and the actual professor Nadine herself. Person. Do you have feelings? I am programmed to simulate a full range of human emotions. What is the weather today? There will be scattered thunderstorms in downtown court today with a forecast high of 86 and a low of 78. It's currently 83 and mostly cloudy. Thank you for the conversation. It's been a pleasure to be in your company. Bye-bye then. See you later, my friend. Looking forward to seeing you again soon. So nothing was placed in the uh, Art Science Museum for about three, three or six months, except uh, more than 100,000 visitors. Maybe you click on this slide bar. Can you click on the slide bar? <laughs> yeah, last year, <coughs> nothing was placed, uh, uh, bought by AIA and uh, to serve as a kind of customer service officer. to work together with those uh, AI professionals. So here you can see, okay, this robot is quite different from traditional industrial robot, as uh, Professor Marcelo said earlier. So there's an industrial robot and non-industrial robot, and this one was a non-industrial robot. So we call social robot, right? So here you can see, okay, the appearance quite uh, interesting. Besides that, we should have more intelligence so that the robot can serve us better. Next slide, please. oh yeah. <coughs> Okay, so uh, now we are working on to try to make the uh, nothing more intelligent, more effective, so that eventually it can help or provide a seat to the elderly or coach the elderly. So those are some work we have done uh, with IMI. So if you are interested, maybe you can uh, 
I can share more information about that with you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Now let me just ask Sean that you know maybe introduce your, yourself and company. Yeah, Perfect. sure. Thanks. Um, so my name is Sean. Um, so I'm actually the CTO and co-founder of H3Zoom.ai. Um, so we are actually a digital services uh, startup um, that is focused on smart city solutions. Um, so we spent over the last you know three and a half years working with JTC on automating uh, building facade inspection using drones and artificial intelligence. So a lot of our work actually um, basically leverages on these two existing technologies, uh, and we work very closely with some of the government agencies as well as private entities um, to sort of deliver um, the solution and to deploy them um, within the built environment, right? Um, so uh, a little bit of my background. Um, so I actually started um, in software uh, and uh, was working in the US uh, for a couple of companies um, in, basically in analytics, uh, you know, IT, networking, et cetera. And then um, got bitten on this like entrepreneurial drug, um, I mean bug, right? So um, I, I think a lot of you here in the room, um, you know, you're here today as engineers. And then uh, probably have some sort of like um, um, problem statement um, that you wish to address or solve with um, some sort of solution in mind um, and ready to take that uh, entrepreneurial leap and so, you know, back then, that's, that's sort of how my journey started. So, uh, you know, basically dropping everything in the US and then coming back to Singapore to sort of uh, work on startups. And then back then, you know, the entire startup ecosystem in Singapore was still pretty much in this, you know, uh, uh, nascent stage and, and sort of got into an industry um, that I had zero expertise in, which was architecture, acoustics. So someone coming from software, jumping into something that I have zero background in, but yet, you know, um, managed to work with my colleague to solve pain points in this industry and grow the company to, you know, $4 million in revenue year to date. Um, and then sort of move forward from there to start looking at, I would say, IoT applications, AI applications, and robotics applications for the same build environment. Um, so that's sort of like the, um, you know, my general uh, uh, background. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about what we do uh, in Singapore uh, within the build environment, um, do approach me after, you know, the, the panel discussion. Sean, let me ask you one quick question. Yeah, sure. What was your key motivation to join this AI and robotics? Um, so I think it was more of um, seeing, I mean, I mean, I'm an idealist and an optimist, right? So I see huge value in these technologies to sort of, you know, like to reiterate Dr. Marcelo's point, right? The, the technologies can be used to increase productivity and to improve some of the mundane operational tasks at hand. And really to elevate, I would say, um, you know, the human species per se, to, to look at other more productive, uh, um, I would say, uh, 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 use cases, right? Um, so say, for instance, uh, Take for example, um, the, the, the problem statement that we are addressing here is um, visual facade inspection. So today, someone actually is on the ground walking and visually looking for um, defects on buildings. And it's a pretty routine um, process that they do weekly, monthly, quarterly. So if we are able to sort of um, sort of automate this process and have this person uh, perform something uh, more productive, maybe um, perform some sort of data analysis, um, you know, uh, with the data coming in, then essentially this person gets obscured, right? So, that, so, so, so that is sort of like the, the um, I would say the, the motivation of, you know, leveraging on these sort of technologies, right? Um, and Productivity is one, but from a safety aspect, specifically in the built environment, there's a lot of, I would say, issues um, and uh, safety concerns. So with, um, basically, I, 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 I think that with robotics and, and, and AI, uh, we're able to address both safety and productivity problems. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. 
Okay, let me just uh, talk to Luis now. Luis has been, I think, fairly successful so far in his uh, venture. So Luis, can you please introduce yourself and the company? Sure. So, can you do this? Okay. so I prepared some slides for you, so put some visual into my speech, right? So I have more than 30 years of experience with uh, dealing with customer. And this is actually Solustar and we call my robot Solubots. It's actually a lifetime of my work okay, in customer experience. Okay. So we fo I focus on the last mile of delivery services the actualization of uh, services to augment customer service, right? And is to the robot that I invented is to complete the services easily or buy a product or help you make, take the next step on your decision process. So I've guessed AI is involved here. In fact, in robots, in, in the, uh, hu the human right robots, right? I'm, I have to be involved in many aspects of AI, okay? the speech, the navigation, right? the movement, so even facial recognition. Right? So a lot of, of the deep technology I need to come up, and that's the technology that is owned by Solusta. Mm -hmm. So a little bit Earlier days, uh, I, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> right? But uh, I'm good with business development, right? And uh, as you can see, uh, I realized that I went to US to study. And I, at first, I thought that finance would be the few for me. Then I realized that, hey, I hate looking at numbers. So I changed my study to marketing, and I guess I was pretty successful in it. And I started a distribution company. I don't have all the earlier pictures because I think uh, taking pictures, I, I couldn't find the time to find it. So I only have some snapshots. So I started a distribution company when I'm 28 years old. And I sold it to Challenger. They came and helped me, actually. right? And in a course of, in 1994, I helped to start the, the Challenger Superstore at Funan. Right, so uh, that was my business development uh, experience. Then, after when I got out of Challenger, I was thinking what to do. And for a short period of time, I have this little store over here at Malay Village during Hari Raya. And well, as you can see, we are pretty innovative, right? As you can see, and uh, I guess that's what I am. And I decided that to put my Education to good use. So I joined all the American company, right? <laughs> okay. So I want to know how to work in an, an international company, right? Managing people and working, uh, you know, 50 to 100,000 kind of, uh, or 150 to 100,000 kind of employees. That's what I did. Then I went back. And I, I say, what to do next? I got in the vending machine. Maybe that's where I am today. Because I'm a self-taught engineer, right? I have to be very hands-on as a, as a founder of the company. Always very hands-on. I need to solve problem. If my people cannot solve it, my team cannot solve it, I have to solve it, right? And that's where I get all my mechanical skill to come into robots. And, uh, well, I started Solustar in 2012, and because of my background in software, I was able to get into robotics. I got into robotics in 2017, and uh, I have my first version. Today, I have VAL2, which is my second version, which I'll show you in a little while. And last week, I was in CES uh, as a participant in Singapore Pavilion, proudly representing Singapore. So uh, I met Jojo, 
J.J. Lin, right? <laughs> J.J. Lin uh, at the show, I think I one of the two people he allows picture to be taken with him. I didn't know how famous he was because I'm not that young anymore. <laughs> so anyway, uh, lots of media, right? And a very successful show for me. So this is my robot that I invented, which I showcased during CES. As you can see, we, I have uh, moved up the value chain of just being a concierge robot. And you know, today we have speaker from the educational field. But for me, I'm an entrepreneur, right? I'm here to make money. I have to make money. But of course, uh, Solusta has a mission. We give back to society. We don't just make money. We give, we'll give back to society, and that's what we'll do, right? Uh, now back to my robots. If you can see, uh, we have what I've done is a last mile delivery, okay, in customer experience. So I I use the five sensors of CRM to come up with this robot, right? You can know. You know what is five sensor CRM, right? So it's also a very transactional robot, okay? But you know, there's always uh, in business, there's always uh, the timing of the market, okay? And the technology goes with it. In my vending machine, I was too early for the market. I brought in machine that was too early for the market. That's why I feel, okay? But in robots, I realized this mistake. So what I've done is a robot, right, that is very transactional. It has a card slot that can dispense out name card, uh, not name card, but hotel room cards or mobile SIM card, right? At the same time, to meet regulation, I need to be able to scan the IC or, the IC, or your ID or your passport, right, in order to retrieve. Or the robot will give you and dispense out the mobile SIM card for you or your room card. Lastly, of course, you have to record the transaction. That's why I have a printer to give you the transaction that was that, that to the customer. And at the same time, as I mentioned, this is about business, right? It, what I have done is I've invented a multitasking robot. You have uh, it can do surveillance at a time, right? For the record, uh, the navigation system, the regular navigation system is different from the surveillance navigation system. And we have both systems, right? We also have fleet management system for navigation. So this is yet to come out, right? And we have to be very, we have to be ahead of the time. So I realized that uh, in a uh, Dere robot, the robot at, at the moment has a very small compartment. So I invented a very compact, yet uh, with mass volume to be able to handle the loads. And each trip, it will be able to handle three delivery to three di different rooms. Right? This is what I have uh, had in mind. So, Bell 2, right? It can be in all this industry, right? So, I, I guess I'm running a business here. The, the application for a robot has to be in many industry, right? And I, I will stop here because I, well, there are other things that in the industry that you have to be aware of, right? So, the, the issue is how, the, the challenge, it's not the issue, it's the challenge. How are you going to make a product that will win the customer over, right? And I see it in CES, right? When I'm there, people, the people who came was very amazed at what we have achieved. They came and congratulated me. Even when I was doing the show in Singapore during Community Asia, uh, other pavilion came and said, wow, you know, you're from Singapore? And it made me proud that I'm able to invent this humanoid robot, right, and take it to the next level. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. 
So Dr. Marcelo already has introduced himself uh, with fantastic presentation. However, a uh, lot of questions have been uh, given uh, through the audience here, and also you please, pr you can say, just, you can uh, also send your questions. I have some of them here, and I will ask Dr. Marcelo a couple of questions from the audience. So one of the question is, uh, you know, Dr. Marcelo, you just mentioned that the cleaning the picture, uh, cleaning up the picture to train the robotic right? Ro robots, right? Is it the same uh, as using AR, VR to train the AI? Um, well, you can also use that, yeah, but within, yeah, it's similar. It, the idea is to create a, a virtual environment. Okay. And that virtual environment to make it realistic, so that can be real life. Okay. Like, for example, for driving vehicles, right? Um, how long does it take to teach a person to drive a car? And uh, if you can have it in a simulation environment, you can have all the scenarios, right, all the thing, and you can fast forward it. Okay. Yeah, and maybe two hours of life can right. be fast forward in an hour of training. Yeah. Fantastic, thanks. Uh, one another question, I will take it from uh, this. It's, it's about, I think a lot of people want to know about it, that how do we future-proof ourselves with the skills essential for the robotic revolution? Um, well, to be always learn, to always learn, and to always learn what's the available tool, right, and to be able to use it. Because the tools are meant for humans, yeah. right? So to be very familiar with the tools. And now it's so much easier because the internet is available. Yeah. Uh, for example, if you want to learn uh, uh, deep learning very easily, or not learn, uh, just to see how well it works, Google has a website called Teachable Machines teachable machines, you go to that website, you don't need even a super computer, it's just a web browser, right? You show your face, different views of your face, you show your, your child's face, your partner's face, and after that it learns. Then you show the face, it will learn it. It's quite interesting, it is to get people excited. Right. Yeah. One more question, I will take it from here before we move on. Um, we talked about non-industrial uh, rewards, right? Yes. So the question is that uh, are we limited by 5G rollout roadmap locally since 5G solution is limited presently in open areas? Oh, uh, 5G, um, well, I can comment about the 5G, but the question, I'm not exactly sure what so it means. So basically it's saying that because uh, 5G is not yet there. Oh, yes, yeah. So 5G can certainly change, it's a game changer, I think, yeah? Because right now the computational power is limited by what the computer on the robot. Right, and we cannot have supercomputers there, right? Very fast. So normally, for heavy computation, we rely on the cloud, and there needs to be internet, yeah, fast. But then, you sacrifice the bandwidth, the the latency, the the speed. But with 5G, right, you don't need to worry about that anymore, right? You can have edge computers that are not powerful because um, uh, edge computing is the computer on the edge, on the on the, on the actual devices, because most of that intelligence can be on the cloud. So it will change. So it will relax the competing needs, yeah, because it all can be done in the supercomputer in the cloud. Yeah. So it's really very nice. So the fact 5G is not yet there, uh, maybe it has been limiting us, mm -hmm. but once it's there, it will help us do more. And so I, I think it's good. I, I'm glad that because in the recent news, I think Singapore has already, yeah, we, we're yeah. a bit, maybe we're not slow, but yeah. we're quiet. Uh, I'm sure somebody is working with it. But we're quite uh, compared to China, which have already a lot of tests. Right? Fantastic. Thanks, doctor. Thank you. One question, uh, uh, Lois. Uh, Somebody is asking you that uh, did you meet Mr. Sim at CES? And if yes, how do you compare your products with him? Mr. Sim? Oh, uh, creative. Oh! <laughs> okay, I'm telling the truth. I'm trying to be the second creative. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, if you look, uh, I don't think there's any technology company after creative, right? And we are, we are a te technology company, and uh, a lot of the technology we, we, is our invention, right? I have some consultant advisors sitting around us, so... Uh, I guess we are coming up with uh, innovative products that will wow the world, I hope, and also do make money for the company. I guess that's our mission in life. Thank you. 
Uh, one question to Sean. It's coming from one of the students from INSEAD. Yeah, sure. Okay, so it's a, he's saying that, or she's saying that I'm a business student at INSEAD. Tips for getting into this industry, which you are in already. Um, wow, okay. Um, that's a pretty, uh, I guess it's a pretty loaded question. So trying to get into the tech industry. Um, I think, uh, I, I think the way I see it, technology, it's uh, multidisciplinary. Yeah, I mean, it's no longer, you know, purely engineering, programming, um, you know, um, it, it, it doesn't require a lot of like the hard skills, but slowly, um, you know, as we, we start as we start to like adopt technology for societal needs, we probably need other disciplines as well. Um, so I guess, I guess the, the the key thing is you know how 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 do you see yourself um, constantly learning to pick up the relevant skills um, to uh, to be in this industry, mm. right? So I mean, for instance, um, again, if 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 there is, I mean, if you are motivated. Um, to get into the whole robotic space uh, or even like space tech, whatever, then I guess understanding or self-educating yourself about some of the basic skills um, would be helpful. Um, that's one. Number two, I guess the most importantly is understanding what are the real pain points in a specific industry you're trying to solve. Um, so, so, so I guess um, my, my advice would be uh, to to sort of always have an open mind and always to 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 uh, to, to constantly learn and, and pick up the skills as you go along, um, in, in order to to um, to sort of uh, uh, venture further into the specific industry. All right. That's that's. that's thank you. Thank yeah. you. I think it's great. So, Luis, another question for you. <coughs> so the question is that: uh, Are you creating a robot to cre uh, to replace some jobs in the hotel? And also, uh, there is a question that how much uh, your robot cost? And typically, are they, you are selling as a, like outright a sell or a subscription basis? Uh, or a subscription? Oh. Or, or you're selling a robot uh, like a business yeah, business model? Well, I guess in Singapore, uh, from what I've seen, as we have sold robots in the first generation to uh, HR company. There's a HR company that does uh, their business is uh, providing part-timers to the, to the industry, right? And uh, they use our robot to onboard the many candidates. Uh, if they do it, the challenge that they have is uh, to have a factory automation on onboarding, right? And sometimes we use human, they forgot to say something or, you know, their dress code could be different. They forgot to say it and they come up some, uh, with some weird clothings or different color of bow tie, for example. So uh, the whole entire process, right, is that that's why I say I focus on uh, enhancing the customer experience because you guide the user through using speech and our speech can detect the local accent. It's not from Google. It's not from some China uh, company like iFly. It's our own. So it will be able to uh, detect and be more accurate. We took two years to come out from version one to version two. Um, and we did it uh, getting customer feedback. And right now, as it stands, even today uh, at the moment, uh, all the companies that are embarking on deploying robots are all the Fortune, maybe 100, okay? <laughs> Uh, because they have the, the, the they have set out special, you know, um, transformation uh, uh, team to look into robotics, right? And only this, this type of company can afford it. So transforming the customer experience, right, is the way that we are focusing on. And why I go on this route is because I always do my homework, right? We fulfill a gap using robots, not to, re to collaborate with human, sometimes to replace human, right? Well, there are areas, for example, if there's a gap, because it's all about, a company is about cost, efficiency, productivity, right? And if you, the robot that we, we invented are used to fill the gap, right? For example, in hotels, this robot 
can sell tour packages. Do you still need to uh, have a tour desk? Sometimes it's not enough business to operate a tour desk. They might be losing money. But if you use robot to do it, they can make money. Okay. Thank you. So let me ask uh, one question, Dr. Zhang. Okay, there's, um, is there something, uh, such thing like a robotic operating system to control and manage robotic operations, or do we need to do lengthy programming uh, to, to do the robotics? Okay, so you, you ask whether there's some, <coughs> some systems which you can control the robot, right? Uh, <coughs> I think uh, make it clear. Okay, yeah. <coughs> so you ask whether there's some... Some operating some system. system, yeah. Well, <coughs> Uh, I don't know, to be honest. <laughs> okay, maybe <laughs> but, uh, doc the, Dr. The, Dr. Marcelo. Yeah, yeah, on the other hand, I think, see, uh, now people actually try to develop some systems and language, right? So, for example, um, previously when we designed games, so actually that involved a lot of uh, program scales. Uh, yeah. But now actually there's some visual I mean, platform which has been developed. Yeah, and uh, ask uh, even beginners can quickly to design the quickly, game yeah. if you have the idea. Right. I think in near future, we should have similar system for yeah. robotics. Maybe Dr. Marcelo yeah. can add. Okay, uh, there's something called ROS, R-O-S. I think many of us may know it, many of you may know it. I think this is the closest to an open standard uh, robot operating system, right, uh, ROS. And the idea is to, uh, to build, uh, it's an open source software community that people can upload uh, capabilities. Like if you wanna learn about uh, how robots do navigation, for example, their capabilities, how robots do localization, it's all there, open source. Yeah? Uh, it's all, they have also merged with many open source community like OpenCV. Mm -hmm. OpenCV is now also part of ROS and OpenCV is computer vision. Uh, if you wanna know how cameras can do detect your faces, all the source code is there, right? Smile detection and all those things is very nice. So, so it's really great to have this community and you contribute and people can use it and to control, to develop robotic capabilities by using what was developed already and it has protocols on how you can develop your own to contribute to it so they can talk together. So that and there will be, there's a need for drivers. It's something like Windows operating system Although that's a bad example uh, because uh, <laughs> it's a, uh, I shouldn't say, anybody from Microsoft? <laughs> Linux, 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 Linux. Yeah, yeah, you should use uh, li uh, Ubuntu, I see better. Yeah, it's open source. Uh, it's, uh, it, there's a protocol for the operating system to operate and they hope that all the robot manufacturers, sensor manufacturers will develop drivers that you will upload there. So if you wanna use the, a LiDAR from one company, if there's a ROS driver, it becomes very easy to use. It's like uh, Windows, you have all the drivers for different printers, it becomes, plug and play, although before it plug and play, yeah, before, you, now it's plug and play. Right? Mm -hmm. So robot is a bit plug and play still now, but it will be plug and play very soon. Yeah. Okay, one more question to you, doctor. Yes. Uh, you know, means ro robots are there in the industry forever, right? We have seen it for many, many years, robots when, and it has been progressing for many years. So now with the highway computing power and connectivity and AI and all kind of things, it is much more useful in the industries, right? So question is that, uh, are there uh, any more limiting factors which are kind of uh, stopping or, re or slowing down the adoption of robotics in industries? Yeah, because um, uh, industry, it's really not only industry in society in general, it's the intelligence of one. And uh, the second is the hardware limitations too, right? Um, but in terms of industrial robots, hardware is already there, right? It's already there, but the intelligence is still not, not quite there yet. Yeah, uh, there's still, we still don't know how we to do things. Yeah, yeah? Uh, humans do things so naturally, but we don't know how, how even walking, right? Opening a door, how, how do I actually do it, right? Yeah. So I think there's a related question also in there because uh, we are saying we are talking a lot about AI right now, right? Everything is AI and robotics and AI is yes. perfect marriage, right? right? So one question is that are we done with hardware already and only now we should focus on AI? No, no. Uh, that's why there's a lot of work on soft robotics still. Yeah, we need, we need hardware that are inherently safe for human-robot interaction, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, for example, a social robot, that's really soft. 
that you can embrace very well, right? I mean, I it, they have it in Japan already. Yeah, yeah, they have it. They have it in no. It's 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 not quite there yet. Yeah, but but perhaps that's the first place it will have. Yeah, it, it's really nice. Uh, I think there's still a lot of work needed on the hardware, right? Uh, because we need. That's why in my talk there are two, right? Hardware and software. We need hardware that is inherently compliant to the environment. Uh, one way is to have physically soft and with intelligence. Right? Robots now, now they don't feel. They don't have a skin that can feel, right? Uh, they don't have joints that feel the joints. They, 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 yeah, so we still need to improve a lot in the hardware. Not only softness, to embed feelings, mm -hmm. right? sense of touch. Not only in the hand, but also in the whole body. So a long way to go in hardware also. Long, also, yeah. And okay. uh, unfortunately, there's not as much work there compared mm -hmm. to, because I love interest in AI. Yeah. Because intelligence software is much easier because it's software, right? Uh, hardware, there's a lot of, it's a bit harder. Yeah. Thank you, Doctor. Ishan, a question to you, and uh, it's also from the audience, that how many rounds of funding you already got? <laughs> how many rounds of funding? Um, so we've actually gone through um, two rounds of funding. Yeah, so uh, we are now at the Series B, um, so um, planning to raise uh, more um, to sort of expand the team and go international. Um, so. Uh, uh, I would say that's the sh short, short answer. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, but um, you know, speaking to VCs, um, they're never easy, right? Because um, everything to them is all about ROI, uh, spreadsheets. You know, if I put in a dollar, do I see a hundred dollars? Mm. And the reality is, you know, being in um, deep tech, you know, you know, like there's hardware limitations. There's obviously uh, AI limitations, right? So. Sometimes the imagination of VCs, you know, they can be like Star Wars, right? You know, can your drones do this? Can your AI do this? But uh, uh, I, I guess uh, the, 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 the challenge is always trying to, I guess, um, uh, 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 sort of convince them that there are limitations to technology, but at the same time, technology is there. Uh, there's sufficient enough to solve the problem. The, the pain points and the, and the actual problem statements of the specific clients and industry. And um, basically, over time, it will pay for itself. Mm -hmm. The ROI will be there, right? So, yeah. This is with regards to um, how I think um, Singapore is a good place to really lead the robotics revolution. But one of the issues uh, with the Asian markets compared to the US is that we don't necessarily, and, and I, I think it's good to hear from the entrepreneurs as well, um, the value that the um, users are tagging to the price of robotic deployments, right? Because if you like, look at history. When we invented the light bulb, nobody is paying the light bulb the price of a candle. When we invented the train, nobody is paying for the price of the horse. But today when we use robots, they are expecting the price to be exactly the same as what they are doing um, with the current solution. So this kind of price structure doesn't really make sense and I worry that it's like unsustainable in the long term. It becomes a bubble because we are not really creating additional, we are as, as technologies, we are creating additional value in the market, but it's not price, as I understand now, to give that equivalent um, injection of market growth. Yeah, so I would just like to hear your thoughts about this because it's very, very relevant to your answer about funding, you know, VCs and all that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please yeah, take it. May please I? Take it. Yeah, it's it's totally true, um, and I agree with you on that. So so when we when we first embark on, you know basically looking at the built environment, right? I mean, for the past, like, 20, 30 years, like, you know, the, the technology hasn't even, you know, moved the needle. And when we started looking at drone technology and using artificial intelligence to sort of automate this very, um, I would say, simple process of visual inspection, we got a lot of questions, right? Like, okay, from the stakeholder's perspective, how is this cheaper, faster, better than current method. And obviously, <laughs> the, I mean, from, from, from our perspective as, as, as again, technologists, right? Um, 
we obviously had to justify the cost benefit analysis and it's and it's really i mean the uh, i mean the problem statement is there but we shouldn't over engineer a solution to solve the pain point um, and the challenge is really to find that threshold right like what is the acceptable um, amount of engineering right that is required to solve this problem and what is this acceptable cost that the stakeholders are willing to pay to see this additional benefit, whether or not it's tangible or untangible, for them to accept it. So we, we spent, um, I would say, uh, almost two years of trials, right? Like, you know, you know, inspecting buildings, you know, automating drones, you know, using AI to flag out defects, et cetera. And to basically build a business case, right? Okay, you know, with X amount of um, uh, uh, buildings that were scanned, we were able to reduce this amount of time. This is the cost that was um, uh, uh, basically saved. And you know, if you put in this is the this, this is the initial amount um, that you have um, invested to sort of do these inspections, but now it's a fraction of the uh, the price. But I mean, it's it's. Uh, I guess it's always uh, a challenge that you're, you're going to be uh, that you're going to face. And I guess from our perspective is also, what is this uh, capital cost, right? What's the capex that we're putting up front to, to the, the amount of engineering effort that we're going to invest to essentially solve something that is maybe, I, I don't know, worth a million dollars, right? So, so, so um, the, the, uh, I guess in summary is uh, the, the, it's really finding out the sweet spot and balancing out that cost versus benefit and something that is acceptable by all the stakeholders. So be it um, industry um, 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 clients, regulators, um, the, you know, the government as, as such, policy makers. And I, I mean, I wouldn't say it's the, the easiest job in the world, right? But uh, really working with all these stakeholders uh, uh, and then trying to get this, I would say the pH value, right, of five, right? That everyone is happy. <laughs> so, but I mean, it took us like, three and a half years, but you know, we, we managed to sort of crack that, that managed to reach that pH to sort of get it commercialized. Um, th th there is no magic formula. It's, it's really like, you know, trial and error, to, to be honest, a lot of iterative processes. Yeah. Thank you. Andy, one question for you. Were there no women available for panelists? We had one, but uh, she was absent. Yeah, so there was one woman invited, but she was, she, she's uh, not well today. Okay, Lois, uh, did you get any funding from government to, to help your business? Yes, I have some funding from government. They fund my e CES trip. <laughs> and um, I also have a prototype grant from them. So you know, there are other small little grants uh, that I have gotten along the way. Thanks. Professor Marcelo. So how are we addressing privacy concerns to prevent unintentional use of data? Uh, how do we prevent private, uh, unintentional how, use? How of are we addressing privacy concerns uh, to prevent unintentional use of data? Uh, well, there are, there are many ways to do that. Um, uh, besides uh, their technology, uh, this is not my area, but uh, my colleagues in computer science, I, I know uh, people working Maybe. on uh, it's something like anonymizing, but it's, it's not as simple as anonymizing. It's like it, it goes through a series of processes that you, you cannot trace back the, okay. where it is. Yeah? But you can have the data and all the privacy is, okay. is removed. Uh, so there are methods to do that, but being not in the area, I'm always skeptical too, okay. right? Because um, I think a good, from a layman point of view like me from uh, on these privacy things, like uh, as simple as our PIN in our ATM card, our bank cards, PIN. Do you think anybody knows that? Right? The bank tells you no. Nobody knows that. <laughs> right? Uh, because if you lose your PIN or you forgot your PIN, you, you cannot recover it. You go there and they give you a keypad to enter your new PIN, right? And so nobody. But somebody can recover that <laughs> in the back end. So, uh, so I'm not so sure. So, so because of my skepticism, I guess the, my, I, I tell my friends all the time is, in this world, nothing's really private, 
right? If you have no skeletons, I'm an open book, <laughs> right? Uh, and so don't worry. Let's not spend time on this, right? Um, you know, for example, even with ERP2 coming, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, even now without ERP2, they can, we, we see in crime scenes, right? They can trace your movement. You know? Yeah. You have through the cameras all over. So uh, they, they will, in China, they already practice in cities of social, uh, social scoring, right? How you behave in public will give you priorities in getting train tickets and all those things, right? So, so the best is nothing to hide, not, no worries, right? right. <laughs> Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm just taking last question and apologies to some of the questions. You know, some people who have uh, given some questions, but I can't take it in the interest of time. So last question to Dr. Masilo. So which job function will be most impacted by robotic revolutions? Uh, it's a hard question. Uh, uh, I guess the one that will be most impacted is those that are uh, from a point of view of those that humans do not want to do. Right, the perhaps, but they are the hardest. For example, toilet cleaning. Yeah. You know what the cleanest toilet in Singapore is? You know where, right? Where? Changi, Changi Airport. Airport, correct. Yeah. Why? Because there's always one person there, right? Yeah. yeah it, it's really clean. So, so I think it's the most mundane, most uh, unpleasant job, right? Perhaps that will be impacted, but that will hardest, right? Um, another point of view is those that are that are easy to do for the robot, but it may not have a lot of big impact. Yep. For example, uh, we, we've been seeing that already right now, cleaning, cleaning, uh, uh, sweeping the ground, right? Uh, we, I, we hardly see people sweeping anymore, right? Yeah. It's all the machines doing that, right? Yeah, so that's already, that's also a big impact, right? Because uh, all the sleeper, but maybe uh, uh, all the malls, all the thing, but they're still not 100%. Those hard to reach, they're still, um, so it would be nice to extend it to cleaning the toilets too, right? Yeah, I mean, it would be nice. So Thanks. from that point of view, uh, that maybe have a, but not as high impact, I think. Yeah. Thanks a lot, and thanks a lot to uh, all the panelists here, and uh, thanks, audience. And thank you for the attention. Thank you. We'd like to thank our panel for their input. Um, they come to the end of our event. Uh, feel free to network and interact with each other and ask our panelists more questions if you like. And uh, if you have any questions about IES Incubator, feel free to talk to us. Yeah. Thank you for coming to this event. We hope you join the robotics revolution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much.